Thanks everybody for coming out. Um, as you said, this is our third speaker. Our fourth speaker will be uh, November 15th, Scott Atlas, um, uh, President Trump's COVID czar will be um, on campus. He'll be speaking on uh, scientific freedom, COVID and the like, and that is in a different building, right? Uh, uh, the Atlas uh, building or something. Um, so we'll get the exact, uh, I think that's in a different, a different location. Our, our man who knows the exact place since I've been on campus only a couple of weeks, I don't know where that building is, but, um, but uh, when you see the announcement, look for the location, we'll try to get the exact uh, details for you. Um, I, it's a, it's a, it's a special thrill for me to, um, to uh, introduce uh, tonight's speaker uh, who we, I think we finally met in person for the first time, but uh, I believe we've, I, we feel like we've been through war together. Uh, there is a, as some of you may or may not know, um, back, uh, um, I, uh, back in um, uh, summer of 2021, I sued my employer, uh, George Mason University, when they imposed a vaccine mandate uh, because I had already had COVID and recovered um, and thereby inaugurated myself into perhaps the most ragtag band of, uh, of uh, rebels uh, um, that uh, one has ever met, uh, which is those of us who are in the COVID dissenter uh, society over the last, uh, last couple of years, speaking up for common sense or as, um, as some of as some people like to say, team reality, uh, as it comes to thinking about COVID, thinking about the trade-offs of dealing with COVID, thinking about creating policy uh, that is actually humane um, and respects individual rights uh, and individual liberties uh, and flourishing, as well as dealing with uh, you know, sound science uh, uh, and the like. And um, uh, Jennifer uh, Say, our speaker tonight, uh, was one of the people who I look to for inspiration and courage during this period. Uh, and she's going to tell you about her experience um, tonight. Um, I will remind, so she's going to speak, and then um, I'm going to ask her a couple of questions. I'll open it up to the floor. Um, as I said last time, I'll ask that if you have questions, uh, please keep them to germane uh, tonight to tonight's uh, topic and tonight's speaker. Uh, it's a real privilege to have Jennifer uh, here with us, and people have come to uh, to hear her. and And please keep any questions, uh, questions, and not uh, comments uh, in in the like, so that we can hear from our from our speaker. Um, uh, as I said, tonight's speaker is uh, Jennifer Say. Uh, her book, uh, which I recommend, um, is Levi's Unbuttoned. The woke, lob, uh, the woke mob took my job but gave me my voice. One of my favorite things about this book is um, Jennifer names names, uh, which is awesome because there are people whose names need to be named uh, and, um, and need to be held accountable um, and uh, or at least held to explain uh, their, their policies. It's a great book. Uh, it is actually her, I believe, second book. Uh, her first book, and I'm sure she's going to talk about this a little bit today, was a book named uh, ch called Chalked Up, uh, and uh, and later she produced a documentary called Athlete A. Uh, Jennifer was a national champion gymnast um, in her youth, um, and um, actually literally won the national championship uh, in gymnastics. Represented America um, at the Goodwill Games um, and was on the uh, national team on many occasions. And she talks about it in her book, and she'll probably talk tonight about how that influenced her experience here with um, with COVID. Athlete A is a documentary that she uh, produced, which won an Emmy Award for the outstanding investigative documentary uh, in which she looked into the scandal involving Larry Nasser and the United States gymnastics um, uh, sex abuse um, uh, scandals uh, at, at the time. Um, she um, is a graduate of Stanford University and then went on to a um, distinguished career at Levi Strauss, um, uh, where she became chief marketing officer, which leads us up uh, to tonight. And so um, tonight, uh, I'm thrilled to introduce Jennifer Say, uh, Levi's Unbuttoned. Jennifer. Thank you, Scott. 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 Thank you,
and I'm going to kind of talk you through my story in a little bit of detail, but, um, you know, really what I've been asked to talk about or what I said I want to talk about is uh, what I perceive as a crisis in American business leadership. Um, there are no courageous business leaders right now. Um, and I think, well, there's a crisis in courage, I think, in all leadership in America. Um, I will talk specifically about business because I spent the last 30 some odd years of my life working in the business sector. And I think what is at risk is American innovation and leadership on the world stage. And I would like to see the people that I worked beside for the last 30 years screw up their courage just a little bit and lead again. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll end on that. I guess before I get right into it, though, a few questions for you to think about, and maybe we'll get to answering them at the end, or I'll answer my own questions if you guys don't have any questions. Um, do you believe that American businesses have a moral obligation to stake, take stands on the issues of the day? Log that one in your head. Do you think they, they, they believe that they do? I mean, they're doing it right all over the place. So do you think that they are doing it out of an honest sense of moral obligation? Or do you think they are doing it because of perceived financial upside or other or some other reason? And, you know, as I tell my story, I think my view will become quite <laughs> clear. And it certainly has become the trend I would say that, you know, started maybe 10 years ago, but really accelerated in the last three to five. Why do you think that is? We can talk about that at the end. So I was telling my, I have four children. I was telling, I have two that are in their twenties that no, don't live with me anymore. They both live in New York. One's in graduate school at NYU and the other is an undergraduate um, in art school at Cooper Union. And I was telling them that I was coming um, to see you to speak. And they were like, why is anyone having you come talk? Uh, and they said, um, I said, well, I need to prepare. I was there visiting them over this past long weekend. And I said, well, I, I need to prepare. I need some time. They're like, you don't need to prepare. Guest speakers come talk all the time and they ramble. They don't ever prepare. So just ramble, it's fine. I said, well, that isn't me. Um, and I told them the subject, it was going to be about the crisis in courageous corporate leadership. And they laughed. They could not stop laughing. They thought it was hilarious. They're like, you're telling me that like CEOs are cowering in the corner and they don't know what to say. And I'm like, yes, that is exactly what it's like. But they didn't believe me. But I, you know, I, I'll, I'll give you um, the story from my perspective. So as I said, I have four children. They range in age from 23 all the way down to six. So that's kind of unusual. Um, and I had a front row seat during COVID as to the impacts. We're gonna talk a bit about COVID, <laughs> a lot about COVID. Um, I had a college student, I had a high school student, I had a elementary school student, kindergarten and a preschooler. I had every age group you could have. You might think I'm crazy, you might be right. Um, but I saw it firsthand, um, and we'll talk about that a little bit. As uh, Todd mentioned, I, I am a former elite gymnast, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this because I think it sort of sets the stage a little bit for, for, for my story. Um, I had a very unusual childhood. I trained six, seven, eight, sometimes 10 hours a day in the summer. It's a punishing sport. I made my first national team at 10 years old. Um, it was and is to some extent still viewed as a very young person sport. And so you have this narrow window of opportunity and you're trying to cram it all in, in the four or five good seasons you have. Um, I am happy to see that there are now gymnasts that are competing in their early twenties. That says to me that we've kind of relaxed on that a little bit, but make no mistake. There's still plenty of abuse <laughs> during my time as a gymnast. I endured a forced starvation diet of less than 400 calories a day. I was fat shamed on a loudspeaker at my gym for gaining a quarter of a pound forced to kind of condition in the corner for an hour after my six hour practice to lose the quarter pound. Um, we were called lazy. I was a piece of garbage. Um, I trained on serious injuries and that is probably the most abusive and unacceptable, uh, I would say torture that I endured because at 54, you know, I still, um, bear those scars. I, I didn't understand that at the time. I thought if you trained on something and it hurt a lot, 
once you stop training, it would just stop hurting and you'd kind of walk out the door and you'd be fine. My body is a testament to that not being the case. I trained on a broken ankle for two years. Needless to say, it doesn't function all that well. I broke my femur at the world championships in 1985. You can watch it on YouTube, though I don't recommend it. But I came back nine months um, after that devastating injury. And that's when I won the USA national championship. So, you know, I, I didn't have the cast long enough of all sorts of terrible, terrible things. And th this abuse I'm describing is all the abuse that is just par for the course that doesn't even include the horrific sexual abuse that you've all probably heard about because of the case of Larry Nasser, which we'll get to also. Um, it all sounds very brave and to some extent it was, but it was also self-annihilating and it definitely wasn't normal. It was not normal, um, but I left the sport ashamed and defeated. I was depressed. I had terrible nightmares. My body was broken. I was anorexic. Yeah, I mean, I was a wreck. I was a mess, <laughs> um, and I had no pride in the fact, and I felt I had no value in the world beyond this sport that I was done with and could no longer do, but was also clearly done with me. So that's where I start at 19. Like I'm in a hole, right? I'm in a deep hole. I go off to college. I'm so happy when I go off to college. I'm like, I finally get to rest. I'd had this whole career that was like totally brutalizing and everybody else is there like, yeah, we get to start our lives. And I thought, oh my goodness. I felt like I was going to the old age home. Anyway, I was relieved though. You know, I wasn't gonna have to train 10 hours a day. Anyway, 20 years later, I did write a book um, which Todd mentioned called Chopped Up. And it exposed the abuses in the sport. I sat down to write it because 20 years after I left the sport, I was still suffering the slings and arrows. I had, you know, cripplingly low self-esteem. Um, I, you know, I had recovered from the eating disorder, but there was, I, I had a lot of blame. I blame myself for everything, which is a pretty typical, um, uh, if a child is abused by a parent, they are told by that parent, I wouldn't have to hit you if you weren't bad. That's what I lived every day in the gym. I wouldn't have to do these things to you if you weren't bad, if you weren't lazy, if you weren't fat. And so as I grew up, I blamed everything on myself. So at 40, I sat down and I wrote this book, not because I thought I was a great writer. I wasn't a writer. And I should say, I, I describe myself as fairly non-functional. I was a vice president at Levi's. I had two children. I mean, I was a functional adult, but I was struggling, if that makes sense. Um, so I sat down to write the book really just to make sense of everything that had happened. And like, why did I feel this way? Like on the surface, I knew that I was this successful person. I knew that I was a functional person. I knew that I was bright enough. I mean, I didn't think I was particularly bright, but I knew that I was bright enough. Um, I knew that I had two great kids. Um, why was I still sort of struggling this way? I really just sat down to write it for that reason, to make sense of it um, for myself. And I certainly didn't think I would get it published. I didn't think it would get the attention that it did. Um, but it did. Um, I didn't tell anybody at work I had written it because I thought, this is this is my mindset in the corporate world, which was the correct mindset. I, I want to just reinforce this. As a woman in the corporate world, I thought I better not tell them I wrote this book. It'll just fade into oblivion because if they know that I write a book and I'm up for a promotion, I'll get overlooked. They'll think, well, it's between her and this other person, probably a guy. It's between these two. And she wants to write books and she does all this other stuff. So she's not as committed. So I kept it a secret, but then I was, lo and behold, I was on Good Morning America and all the morning shows. And so that plan did not work out so well. Um, I was not, this is an interesting point when it comes to uh, corporate corruption and cowardice. I was scheduled to be on the Today Show, which is NBC's morning show. They are also the network that runs the Olympics. My book came out a few months before um, the 2008 Olympics. They canceled under strict orders to not show anything negative about any sports in the Olympics. So I should have <laughs> known. I didn't think much of it. Um, but anyway, I was on the news a lot. I did all the shows. Everybody saw it. And as I said, I wanted to keep it a secret because I thought it would hold me back in my career. It, um, interestingly, it had the opposite effect. It had the exact opposite effect, which was really kind of nice. I'd already been at Levi's 10 years. Um, they looked at me suddenly and saw someone who was you know, a brave truth teller and creative enough and disciplined enough to sit down and write, write a book, which was great. So, you know, because up until this point, I had done quite well um, 
in the workplace, but I was sort of seen as they called you an operator. Does everybody know what that is, an operator in the corporate world? It means you're like a functionary, like you're a good number two or three, you can't lead, you don't have vision, you're an operator. You know, sit here next to the guy who makes the decisions and like make sure it gets done. That was me, or that's what they told me I was. <laughs> Suddenly they saw me as somebody um, that was brave enough to lead, and you know you have to keep in mind. I wrote about all the abuse, and it's interesting you mentioned I name names. I never thought to not name names when I when I wrote this um, the second book. In the first one, I did debate it because I call out, for instance, the man who was the national team coach throughout uh, the '80s, who was a sexual abuser and assaulter, and the entire organization covered for him. I debated whether to use his name or not. I decided to use his name and he was eventually banned from the sport because of the book. So I'm glad I used his name. These are not fictions. We have to, if you're willing to say the truth, you have to say the truth. And this was not a fiction. I felt not using names, put it in the realm of fiction. It's not fiction. Um, so everyone at work was pretty happy and proud. Um, the USA Gymnastics less so, and, <laughs> and not just USA Gymnastics, but the entire world of gymnastics and even beyond gymnastics, the Olympic movement. And so it was really my first um, sort of go at getting canceled or sort of mini canceled. Um, this was before the Me Too movement. You didn't have to believe women. Um, you weren't supposed to believe them, I suppose. Um, and what I learned very quickly is that everybody in the U.S. Olympic Committee, USA Gymnastics, these sort of corporate entities that run these sports that make money on, off the backs of children, athletes, young adults, they don't care about these athletes at all. They're making a lot of money. They have well-paid executives. They raise money off of gymnastics in case you don't know it, is that women's gymnastics is the most watched sport in the Summer Olympics. You know what that means. Those $40 million sponsorship deals that the USA, USOC is able to sell, it's on the backs of those children who are competing. Well, sponsors don't want to invest in a sport that is abusing, belittling, demeaning, sexually assaulting. So, you know, young children. And so it was very, it was imperative to uh, cast me aside and make me basically an unreliable witness <laughs> or an unreliable narrator uh, because sponsorship dollars were at risk. I naively thought when I wrote the book that it was an open secret that this is what was going on, not a secret secret. I didn't really, really, really realize I wasn't supposed to say anything, but I learned that very quickly. Um, I mean, I was harassed by the head of USA Gymnastics. The peers of mine that I had trained with um, came after me. I mean, I was stunned. I was like, you know what it was like. We were there together. They all called me a liar. They called in on the radio when I was on NPR national programs. The head of Gymnastics Australia went on TV shows and talked about what a lying, disloyal person I was. She was later fired from the head of, as the head of British Gymnastics for overseeing years of abuse of athletes. So, Ha, Jane Allen. <laughs> USAG did a full court press. They ran puff pieces about how happy and joyful all the gymnasts were and how they didn't really train that hard. And it was really nice and it was all great. And they got to eat all kinds of food and they'd show them eating. And everybody just tore me, tore me down. So I learned really fast that it really stinks to go first. But here's the thing. I wrote the book because I continued to suffer the repercussions from the abuse in the sport. And I wrote the book because I wish somebody had stood up for me as a child. And I thought if I expose this, I need to stand up for children so it doesn't keep happening. USAG insisted, oh, that was the eighties. It doesn't happen anymore. Mm, it was the same coaches, you know, I, give me a break. So 10 years after I wrote the book, Larry Nasser, who was the doctor for Team USA Gymnastics went to prison for life for sexually abusing over 500 young athletes. Mm -hmm. Um, and suddenly in 2018, he was convicted and I was redeemed. 
the entire community pretended they'd always stood with me. But they hadn't, I remember. It, it's amazing the mental gymnastics, you know, that can happen <laughs> and people convincing themselves um, that they've always been on the right side. And I try very hard to admit when I've made a mistake and when I've been on the wrong side, because we all are sometimes. And I think we need to be honest with ourselves. Um, when the story was breaking, and I'm gonna move on from gymnastics in a second, but I, I do think it's all relevant. When this Nasser story was breaking, so he had already been arrested, he was about to go on trial. I was the chief marketing officer at Levi's at the time already. I called my fellow CMOs at places like Procter and Gamble and McDonald's. Um, what were some of the other ones? Those are the biggies. There were others, um, at and And I said, have you guys thought about trying to put some pressure on? Cause at this point they had still had the same head in place, the same CEO who had overseen all of this abuse. I said, have you thought about maybe putting some pressure on them, financial pressure to change the way they treat the young athletes? I called, I wrote emails. These are people I knew. No one called me back. No one. They did not want to do that. That, that, that's, um, that's the courage that they exhibit. They eventually pulled out the money, but not until it was, it was long after he was convicted. It was long after he was convicted. So, you know, I should have gotten the message then that there's not much courage in the corporate workplace, but I still didn't quite get the message. <laughs> anyway, in 2018, I did go from being a pariah to being uncanceled overnight. Um, and I held that close to me. I think the fact that people do realize, you know, the truth outs in the end, I honestly believe that truth outs in the end, but I, in, in terms of my next endeavor, um, in, in truth, I was not able to beat the, the buzzer. Um, I think the gymnastic story is important because what I would say is I'm not especially brave. It's very hard for me to screw up my courage and say a thing that I know is going to cause backlash. I told you I started in a hole at 19 when I went into the world. I was trained to be super obedient, more than any of your children. <laughs> can can fathom. I mean, I was trained that gymnasts were seen and not heard. Um, and so for me to do it, it's a great effort because I'm also not a contrarian by nature. We were joking about, uh, Todd and I were joking about my husband earlier who is a contrarian by nature. <laughs> he likes to fight, I do not. And so it's very difficult for me. I don't like being hated, I really hate it. But I am loyal to the truth and I am committed to common sense and I am certainly committed to protecting children. And so you, I will endure the slings and arrows of a vicious mob to stand by both truth and children. That's my hill. People say to me all the time, why was this the hill you were willing to die on? Why were you willing? Just wait it out. Why didn't you just wait it out? And I say, why weren't you willing to die on a hill for children and truth? I think you need to look your own self in the mirror and not ask me why I made that decision. So all of that said, I was redeemed for about 37 seconds before I decided to open my mouth about COVID. Um, so I had maybe a year, maybe one year. And then in March of 2020, um, COVID hit. I had already been at Levi's for 21 years, long time in the world today of corporate America. Nobody stays for that long. Um, I started in 1999 as an entry-level marketing assistant. I'd had a long-standing love affair with Levi's. We, we had a saying at Levi's, um, well, our tagline was live in Levi's, which is a campaign that I created. Um, but we had this insight that had kind of gone into developing that tagline, which um, was, I wear other things, but I live my life in Levi's. And somebody had said this to us in Chicago a young man in Chicago. He told us, I wear my Levi's everywhere, music festivals, road trips. I traveled across Europe with my backpack. I wore my Levi's. It was my Levi's and my backpack. And so my story, we would always ask people, what's your Levi's story? Every time I sat down with a celebrity and did a new contract, met, so tell me your Levi's story. If they didn't have one, I didn't sign them. I want an authentic 
relationship. So my Levi's story that I always offered first, if they asked, not everybody asked, um, was I went to Moscow in 1985 for the first ever Goodwill Games, which is like a rogue style Olympic competition started by Ted Turner. And I brought 10 pairs of 501s to trade with the Russian gymnast. And I did trade. They were the best in the world. I got track suits and leotards and they got 501s because Levi's 501s stood for freedom on the world stage. And that's why they wanted them. They knew that. So when the opportunity to work at Levi's presented itself to me in 1999, I jumped at the chance. I'd worked at the Gap before that. I'd worked at an agency. I didn't like any of these places. I was a very reluctant corporate um, employee and ultimately executive. I never really wanted any of it, but the idea of working at Levi's and this brand that I worn since I was six years old that I just loved, it was, it was awesome. It was too good to be true. And then when I got there, it was better than I thought. It wasn't like other fashion companies. I had worked at the Gap, which I did not like, which felt very, I used to tell people it felt like, like I had entered like the world of the Stepford Wives. Like everybody had it. It was not my jam. It was like I had to wear a twin set and pearls and like, it just was, mm. um, and nobody wore the product that we made and that was looked down on. It was like, if you ask someone, are you, oh, is that, Gap, I worked at Banana Republic, which has been recently purchased. They would say, no, it's some fans Prada or Jill Sander. And I was like, well, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> um, so when I got to Levi's and everybody wore Levi's every day and everybody rocked them in their own way and you dressed like yourself and you didn't follow you know, a script, I thought this is the place for me. And then I learned about their sort of what they called profits through principles. And I was I loved it. I was enamored. They really had always tried to sort of do the right thing. In the 50s, they integrated factories in the South before the law required it. In 1992, um, they were the first Fortune, five com for Fortune 500 company to offer same-sex partner benefits. I was like super proud to work there. Um, and then in the 1980s, this got reversed later, but the CEO was Bob Haas, who's the great-great-grandnephew of Levi Strauss himself. Levi Strauss had no children himself. Um, he refused to enter the China market when it opened because of human rights violations of the Uyghur. This is in the 80s he did this. <clears throat> There's a whole Harvard Business Review article about it. He at first was celebrated and then he was pilloried as the reason for the decline of this once great brand because the brand did I, I, I'm not going to say it suffered because of that decision, but the brand did struggle in the 90s for all kinds of bad decisions. I love that he made that decision. He was right back then, in my humble opinion. In 2013, I became the CMO. I held the post for eight years. The CMO is the chief marketing officer. Um, that's a really long time to be in that job. The average tenure as a CMO is about 24 months, sometimes 18. You get, it's a real slippery seat and you get fired real fast <laughs> and it's filled with a lot of fakers. You know, it's like people who pretend to be these wacky creatives. Um, there's not a lot of people that bring the sort of right and left brain to the job, the creativity and the discipline. Um, and I, you know, I loved it. It was a it was a great job. But the thing I took most seriously was leading my team. I first of all, when I took the job, the business was near bankruptcy. So Levi's almost went under in 2011. I got the job in 2013. Um, I was thrilled to be there, but we had some serious reinventing to do. And I knew I couldn't do it alone. I knew I had to do it with a great team. And I took great pride in helping people build meaningful careers. That was one of the most important things to me. Um, I knew I'd be more successful if they were more engaged and felt that they were connected to the brand and the business and could build a meaningful career and take care of their families. That was the best part of the job for me. It's the most heartbreaking part of how all this went down because not one of those people came to my defense. That said, it didn't happen overnight. The reinvention of the brand, it was a long road, but in 2019, we had a successful IPO. And that was a really proud, very proud, proud moment. I was given the job by the relatively new CEO in 2009, or uh, he started in 2011, and I was given the job in 2000, 
and 13 because we agreed on where the brand needed to go. We actually came together because we hated this campaign, which some of you may remember and some of you may not, called Go Forth. If you ask any advertising creative in the world, you can go Google it when you go home. Um, every advertising creative on the face of the planet, this is their favorite campaign. It's dark and moody and it is terrible. It showed <laughs> young people marching through the streets and setting things on fire. Um, creatives around the world love it to this day. And we both hated it and it performed terribly. And it sort of positions, it, it, it's, it's, it's such an, a ludicrous endeavor, in, in my opinion, this campaign, because it's a capitalistic endeavor. It's, it's advertising, touting communism. We are all workers was one of the taglines. Anyway, it was terrible. He and I agreed on that. That's why he gave me the job. And he also knew that I was disciplined, financially disciplined. I respected data and research. Um, so he put me in the job. I was in the job for eight years. And then in 2020, amidst my COVID dissenting, which I'm about to get to, I swear, I got promoted to brand president literally during the dissent. So I didn't do such a bad job. I was the first woman ever to hold the post. And I was told ever to be the global brand president. And I was told that I would be the next CEO or I could be, but then I didn't. So what marked the beginning of my end, and I don't want to bore you with my COVID um, crazy. As Todd said, we all were, we were a small group that dissented early and we got to know each other. And I think some of us still are a little obsessed with it. I'm trying to let it go. Uh, it did change my whole life. I lost my city, my friends, my job and the future job prospects. So I, I get to be a little, you know, I get to hang on to it a little bit. I'm having fun anyway. Um, so I was very outspoken from the beginning about closed schools and restrictions to children. I was um, not happy about any of it, but I was being strategic and I thought children, we can all come to, to, together on children. And when I say I was outspoken, yes, I was tweeting. Um, I had the opportunity when I wrote my book to go back because I thought, I want to go back and look at these tweets. Like everybody was so mad. They must have been terrible. I probably called people names or something. I stand by everything I said. I was very diplomatic. Um, I cited data, I never called anyone names. I, 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 I stand by it, it's sort of insane to me now when I look back at it and I think that what I said was that that could have been controversial. Um, but I was very outspoken, I did tweet, I wrote op-eds, I ended up being on a lot of local news shows and then some national news shows. One was the straw that broke the camel's back. I, I led rallies, I led a group called Open School San Francisco, I should mention, as a senior executive in the company, I was the only person that sent my kids to public school. So their children, all the other children, not just for senior executives, but right on down the line, probably two, three, four <laughs> levels below me, all had their kids in in-person private by fall 2020. So this is what set me on fire, among many other things, is I am being told, starting in the fall of 2020, I need to stop doing this. And their kids are all in school. This is not courageous corporate leadership. <laughs> so I had a series of conversations over the course of 18 months. You need to stop. You need to think about what you're saying. When you speak, you speak on behalf of the company. I'm sort of play acting the conversation that happened with a member of the board, the head of legal, the head of HR, the head of CorpCom. I could go on and on and on. Um, when you speak, you speak on behalf of the company. No, I don't. I'm a mom of four public school children. Are you telling me I need to stop? No, we can't tell you you need to stop. Okay, thanks, I won't. Thank you. <laughs> that was basically, and I got really good at it, and it got easier. Um, and I would say, okay, thank you. You know, is that all? Can I go now? Can I go virtual? It was all on Zoom. We were not in the office, as you might imagine. I kept doing my actual job. I got promoted. The stock reached an all-time high six months into my brand presidency, which was around the time I decided to go on the Laura Ingram show on Fox. <laughs> <laughs> to say decided is not really the correct description. I was invited and I agreed. We were a year into COVID at that point. San Francisco was not opening their public schools and the mainstream media, what I would consider mainstream, the New York Times, CNN, me and my little open schools ragtag group of moms had lobbied to get on these shows in the conversation. They would not represent our view. They did not want to hear from moms who seemed normal because we were all called 
racist, eugenicist, QAnon conspiracy theorists, if we came on and we seemed not like that, then their story sort of didn't work. So they couldn't have us on. Um, let's see. So around the time when I went on that show, that really blew things up. I should mention, so the, the, the pushback during this time is coming internally, but it's externally also. You know, there's people externally, I, starting in the, in the fall of 21 that are calling for my job. They're calling the hotline, they're calling the ethics hotline to say, I don't know that I didn't have any ethics. <laughs> I don't know what they said. I know they were calling. There was a Reddit thread um, that was a bunch of ex-gymnasts, interestingly, and gymnastics fans calling for my firing. Only 52, it was a, there was a petition. They got 51 signatures, so not that many. But this was all very upsetting to people internally, and they kept telling me I needed to stop. I want to also, hold on a second. So, so when I did the Ingram angle, um, I stand by everything I said. I'd do it again. I'd say it again. I'd say everything I said to her again and have been on the show, I think, two more times since then. <laughs> um, but it was very upsetting to people. And I eventually had to do what was called an apology tour in, 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 in the workplace, the virtual workplace, and explain my advocacy for children, explain why I was a racist, which was literally one of the questions. Um, and I, you know, I, I was prepared up front. I was given a list of questions I should be prepared to answer, one of which was, are you one of us or one of them? And Here's what's crazy to me is when I got that list of questions in 2021, I was like, okay, I can answer these. Like I was so deranged that of course, you know, I was even thinking, of course I have to answer these questions. Um, now they seem completely deranged to me, but I just want to, in the summer of 2020, I'm kind of going back and forth in time here. Things got really nuts at work, right? This was we were a few months into COVID. It was the summer of the protests and, you know, George Floyd had been murdered and the, there were the, the protests and it went really crazy. And in the corporate culture, and I'm sure you could observe it from outside, there was a lot of pressure to make statements about everything, everything. You had to make a statement about everything. And we did. I wrote a lot of them. I, I wrote many of them. I supported um, and to some extent still support some DEI initiatives, but these, these demands for statements came every, it, it started in the summer 20 and then they were every day, everything. Something happened in Hungary and we were supposed to be ready with a statement because they, I don't know, did something in some Hungarian elementary school. That's not a joke, that's real. Um, we had a pride influencer. So we always had done a big campaign for, for pride um, in the month of June. We had an influencer in our pride campaign and we started getting complaints. I got complaints internally that this person stood for violence. I was like, what are they talking about? They didn't give me any specifics. So I start to do my own research and I'm going on his social media. This is relevant to the moment that we're in. And all I could find was he was, he's an Israeli. Yeah, this is in. I think this is summer of 21. And so I came back to the person complaining who said, you can't, you can't use this person in our campaigns because he represents violence. He represents violence and that's not our values. And I said, I don't understand what you're talking about. He's like a fashion blogger. <laughs> Jimmy, <laughs> really? Is it because he's Israeli? Yes. So then I, I said, I'm sorry, we're not going to fire this guy because he's an Israeli. And he didn't even talk about Israel. All he had was an Israeli flag in his profile. So I went back to my team and I said, I know there's some, you know, noise about this, but just lay low. Don't do anything. They said, oh, we already let him go. Then a woman by the name of Alexi McCammond was hired by Teen Vogue, a young black woman, 27 years old, political journalist, was hired to be the um, editor in chief of Teen Vogue. It was like, it was cool. She was cool. She was like a real journalist. And in under three weeks, she was hired and then fired, let go, whatever, because she had some racist tweets supposedly when she was like 16, which she apologized for in the interview process. But then what happened 
all these corporate, these tweets became public and all of these corporate folks who run pages in Teen Vogue said to Teen Vogue, you have to fire her. So I went to my team and I said, do not weigh in on this. They already had. They pulled the pages. I was trying to get my arms around all this. I mean, and you might think, what were you doing? How did you not know your team was doing this? I, my team was 900 people in 120 countries. So I gave a lot of power and authority as one should to the leaders. And I was disappointed to learn that they were making these decisions. Um, so that's what it was like. And it's just gotten worse. It's like, and so I kept saying to my peers, my executive peers, we have to stop this. We cannot make a statement on every single thing. We cannot. We are distracted. We are not tending to the business. We need to talk about the genes. We need to talk about the genes or we're going to really lose control of this thing and we're going to lose the business. And the issues that we were being told we need to take stances on by young employees were there was less and less cohesion around an agreement on the right side. In, in which case I said, let's, let's get back to jeans. We need to get back to the jeans. And I, you know, look, I had led campaigns. We did a whole thing, my, my campaign, my sort of like signature campaign was built around this idea of using your voice because Levi's was all about originality and individuality. And that had evolved into a campaign around voting, not who to vote for, but just to vote. Use your voice, use your vote. It's a very inspiring ad. I still love it. It's set to an Aretha, uh, Aretha Franklin track. You know, I sort of blame me. I started this, I guess. <laughs> but then it kind of got out of control. And I was like, we need to stop. We can't do this anymore. It's going to destroy the business for many, many reasons. You're going to alienate half of the country. We are distracted and we're not focused on product excellence and unifying marketing, which is what got us here in the first place. It's a mistake. We need to stop. There needs to be a, a line here. So I lost that battle. Um, the CEO became, the, the C, my, I'm not going to blame on the CEO. The, my C-suite peers became very, very intimidated by a young group of very loud employees. And I'm going to take it out of Levi's and say, this is true across the country. They are terrified of young employees. They are taking cues from the heads of HR and the heads of corporate communications who do not own the business. This is a mistake. They should be support function. And the, the heads of HR are telling them, if you don't take a stand on issue, what? Abortion. Every woman will quit in this company. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. This was a conversation that I was actually a part of. I was like, what? No, they're not. They all live in California. They're fine. Um, that was an actual conversation. Those are the threats being levied. Every Everyone will quit. And the CEOs are scared. They're really scared. They are believing, they are given misguided information that is very emotional and they are believing them. So in my particular case, they were being told, Jen has lost the ability to lead. She's lost the trust and faith of the employee population. You, she needs to go and tweets live forever. So she needs to go. The way that story ended, and then I'm gonna get to just very briefly why I think CEOs are doing this right now and we'll take questions. Um, so I was told in the spring of 2022, um, there's no longer a place for you. You know, you didn't listen when we told you to <laughs> stop. Um, and so you're going to, you're going to have to go. Here's some severance. I didn't accept the severance because I didn't want to sign a non-disclosure agreement. And that was it. It was in the news. I, I basically resigned with an op-ed that went kind of viral and then I wrote this book. So that, that's the story. But I've had a lot of time to think about why is this where we are? Why is this what's happening? Why do companies feel the need to do this? I think there's a few reasons. I think the CEOs, I think it started back during Occupy Wall Street. That's when it started, if I trace it back. They wanna distance themselves from the greedy kind of banking magnets and oil barons and that whole sort of greed is good set. They want to distance themselves from that. They still want the money, 
Let me be clear. <laughs> CEOs make 400 times the average salary of an employee. I often raise the idea of potentially capping that half. They did not know. I was not invited back to those meetings, as you might imagine. Um, so they want the money, but they want the positive attention that they get from taking these stances, these fake stances. They get fawning praise from the press. The journals don't investigate. They put people like Elizabeth Holmes and Sam Bankman Freed on the covers of magazines and they give them awards. It's, it's crazy and they all want that. The press doesn't question anything. They don't question their business leadership. They love it. They eat it up with a spoon and the CEOs love it because they get to be heroes, not just greedy business people, but on the side, they're taking all the money for themselves still actually more so than they did 20, 30 years ago. Um, they're greedier than they were 30 years ago, but they convince everybody they're effective altruists to, to quote Sam Bankman Freed. Um, and I do think it happened in the Occupy. I think it started there. And they get praise from their own children. They like that too. And they're all in the coast, so they live in a bubble, so they think everybody agrees with them. Although I think there's some pushback now, and I think they're starting to get nervous. Um, I thought, there's one CEO I will cite who I think has acted with some degree of courage, and I thought it might kind of break through and make a difference. And that's um, Ted Sarandos from Netflix. It's a tiny thing. It's a tiny thing, but in the summer of 2021, he was being threatened and he was being told by employees um, that he needed to take uh, Dave Chappelle's show, The Closer, off of the platform. Have you guys seen the show? Yes. <laughs> Good, you like, you don't like. Yeah, it's funny, it's funny, yeah. I mean, I love, I love Chappelle. Um, he said, he was told, you know, New York Times reported there were gonna be thousands of protesters. There were like 30 and he wrote an email to the employees and he said, with all due respect, and he knew that it would get, you know, sent to the, the press and be published. Um, and he, he said, we're going to run a lot of different types of content for a lot of different kinds of people. That's what we do. That's the business we're in. If you don't like it, then this probably isn't a great place for you to work. I'm paraphrasing. No one left. Everything was fine. Back to business. The Spotify guy, I think his name is Daniel Eck, did basically the same thing um, when he was threatened with mass exodus because of not taking Rogan off the platform who he'd paid $200 million to acquire. I don't think he was gonna take him off the platform. But the, no CEOs took a cue from that. They continue to be terrified of employees. Now, the thing that has happened in the last couple of months that I think is making a difference, I'm sure you guys know what I'm gonna say, um, the two instances, Bud Light and Target, which have resulted in, I mean, the Bud Light business has cratered. Target, I think, is kind of recovering. But interestingly, their CEO, Brian Cornell, in their last earnings call, acknowledged this was the first loss, I think, the first sort of downtrend in sales, the first down numbers they'd had since 2014 in a quarter. They had had growth every quarter since 2014. He acknowledged that their pride collection had gone too far. I was surprised he didn't try to say it was something else. And he said that the last time they saw a dip in sales in a quarter was when they introduced, uh, how did he put it, um, sort of non-gendered bathrooms. Um, and that they took a hit for that. So he sort of tied the things together. I, he didn't say they weren't gonna do it again. and. I, you know, I have all kinds of feelings about any of this. I'm not going to kind of weigh in on my my thoughts on 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 um, on gender, but it's a it's a fact that it impacted their business. It's a fact that it impacted their business. Now you can argue he was being courageous, and but I think right now what is happening is that large businesses, at the end of the day, like I said, they care about money more than they care about anything. And big businesses, I think it's a dereliction of duty. Your responsibility is to make a great product, support it with unifying marketing, exercise financial discipline, and treat employees well. Pay them fairly, enable them to have a great life, and take care of their families. Your job is not to save the world. And if I tell young people all the time who ask me where I should work, if a CEO starts waving his arms around and saying he's going to save the world, you should run and you should go work somewhere else because that's a load of shit.
<laughs> if he's saying that he is going to make this amazing pro product that is going to make your life better and make consumers' lives better, and he's going to pay you really well and fairly, and there's great benefits, and he wants you to build a lifelong career here, that sounds like a great place to work to me. So I think that's what CEOs need to get back to. I think there are room for upstart brands to push back on the status quo. Um, there is a whole sort of emergent parallel economy that is happening, which you know we can talk about, but I think for big brands with a broad consumer base, they need to get back to business or what I call in the book, normie capitalism. But I think it's a long way. These, these companies are big, they're tough to, to, to turn. And um, they're, they're not very courageous. And so what they do is what they did last month. <laughs> and they're afraid of these young employees and they don't understand social media. So they think that they don't understand that even though it lives forever, it also no one pays attention after it goes to the bottom of the feed. So it's a little of both. So there's all sorts of problems, but I, I trust that eventually, and I say this um, not in a bad way, their greed will win out in the end and they will get back to the financial discipline and the delivery of great differentiated product and marketing that appeals and unites because they want that bonus in the end. <laughs> that is it. I will uh, take questions. So, that was terrific uh, to finish. Um, you want to go back to the questions I had in the beginning? I want to hear what you all think. <laughs> Do you think CEO. American businesses have a moral obligation to take a stand on the issues of the day? We'll give them a chance to think about yeah. that. So, uh, uh, let's go quick. First, I feel though, is, um, you know, is, is your host, I feel like I should give you one minute, no more, for any yeah. commentary on the Friday football game uh, since you went to Stanford. So, uh, <laughs> imagine that one minute if you let me gloat during the day. So. I don't need a minute because I don't know what happened. All right. <laughs> Squandered a 29 oh. point lead to biggest loss. Uh, so yeah. they just come back ever to Stanford. So, uh, so we'll move on that cheerier subject, uh, <laughs> like the complete, uh, you know, moral bankruptcy of American corporations. <laughs> um, one of the things I think is fascinating about your your book to me um, is somebody who is a professor and not a, um, a a CEO, and most certainly not a progressive, um, is from somebody who's been in both those worlds to see. Your experience of both of those, I and mean, we've been through them in Quebec. And I was going to just spoil those in one or two questions with some uh, some quotes you have in your book yeah. that jumped out at me. Um, uh, one first about sort of corporate leaders and corporate executives. Um, uh, two things that jumped out at me was the first was um, uh, a um, a quote. They, this comes from um, what Kelly, uh, who's a communication person, said to you. Um, we're not seeing a lot of upside to LS and Co. jumping in on this one, meaning school. There's a lot of potential negatives as we speak up strongly, starting with the numerous execs who have kids in private schools in the city. Um, and then you say later on in the book, um, in one of your completed chapters, saying we cared was a ploy meant to conceal how little we actually did. This is the fundamental lie of woke capitalism. Um, and I just wonder if you want to elaborate on that. One of the things that you know, I was wondering is to what extent is this um, just the corporate leaders? They're just transactional people. It was very striking that what they really cared about was it would look bad for them, uh, for the company to consider doing the uh, to, to to do the right uh, to do the right thing. And, and so, you know, to what extent is this about just them and their personal image? Right. Um, and um, and what is it about sort of? you know, responding to squeaky wheels and these yeah. sorts of things. They're narcissists. I mean, I don't think that's surprising to anyone that most CEOs are <laughs> narcissists. And, um, wasn't there some whole document? And they're like sociopaths. Like they don't have, they don't care about the people, but they have huge egos and they want to be beloved. 
And it used to be that you could be beloved or not beloved, but regarded well for having a lot of money. Now that's not, that's a strike against, that's privilege. You don't, you don't get kudos for that. So they had to find another way to generate respect and compliments and you know, have their kids think they're not evil. Um, and this became the way to do it, honestly. It's a cloak, it's a shield from scrutiny. Um, and it generates, like I said, magazine covers. Like how, any, I'm, I have to rant about Sam Magnum Freed for a second. I mean, like how anyone ever bought this like idea of effective altruism when he was living in a $40 million <laughs> tax shelter in the Bahamas, it's completely ridiculous. And Michael Lewis bought it and everybody bought it at Forbes and Fortune. And it was, I, I, I've been obsessed with Elizabeth Holmes like since before the story. Like I, I, she always seemed like such a, wackadoodle to me but so not um not what she was presenting and i just never understood how people couldn't see the truth and one of the examples i use in the book is like every other business we let well not every other business tech business boom during covid but real businesses that sell stuff that have stores really struggle so you know our business tanked. We were down 70% in April of 2020. That's a number you never think you're going to see as a business leader. Um, so of course we had layoffs. And of course we, the headlines were, we did it with empathy. We're going to lay these people off with empathy. The, the, the empathetic thing to do would have been to fight to get the stores open so we could keep people employed. That would have been the empathetic thing to, to my mind. Um, and then of course, the CEO cashed out $43 million in stock wow. on the heels of a stock boost from the land. But what I don't understand is why do people buy it? Why do the employees buy it? Why do the people who buy the stuff buy it? You know, Nike is one of my favorite examples. <laughs> Nike loves running Women's History Month campaigns and We Empower Women, and they've had three at least very high profile front of the New York Times um, expose on how poorly they treat women in many modalities, right? Like the women in the company are harassed sexually and otherwise. Um, they abused a young athlete, a female runner in the Oregon Running Project to the point of suicidality, and they refused to pay their pregnant athlete. Okay, so they don't treat women well. They don't care about women. I, I know tons of people that work that they do not treat women well. And yet they run a campaign every March and everyone's like, yay. It's just so, like, if you're going to care about this stuff, at least care that they're honest about it. I'm not even going to get into manufacturing in China and everything um, they do in that regard. It's like, I don't understand why people buy the fake campaign. You? <laughs> I, I certainly don't. Um, <laughs> let me ask you another, so to shift to another subject. So your the other side of your, your brain, right? The progressive uh, yeah. side. So it's on page four, you say, having come from the progressive side of the aisle, I was caught short and alarmed by the progressive savagery and policing their own by unforgiving drive to purge the unworthy and heretical. For those on the side that supposedly celebrates diversity, to trample anyone who veers from government issued talking points to hold any such dissent as profane seems a, such a transparent and obvious trespass against their own stated values. Um, and one of the things that struck me was when you went on Laura Ingram, nobody wanted to debate or talk about anything that you said. No. The mere appearance on Laura Ingram uh, was a uh, was a at least a microaggression, if not a macro aggression. <laughs> macro, um, sure. You describe in the book, you describe progressivism, uh, sort of progressive mindset today as being cult-like in yeah. terms of this notion, either you're with us or you're, you're, you're not with us. What has that experience been like for you? Did you see that before all of this, or is this something that you kind of became a, a, aware of? And where do, you, where do you think about that now? I felt it creeping in, but I didn't think it was going to be quite as, I mean, COVID sort of lit it on fire in my mind. It was, it was creeping in, certainly. 
Um, you know, for I'll, I'll give it for instance, you know, our company, like every other company, started to do very aggressive um, DEI training, anti-racism training. And I was very supportive. I sat through a training with uh, Robin D'Angelo herself. I participated. I kind of was like, this doesn't feel right sometimes. But I, you know, I was like an enthusiastic, relatively enthusiastic participant. Um, but then I started to have people on my team coming to me and saying, these are leaders. Like, this is like the as VP of design, like this woman with 30 years of experience, best in class, she would say, I'm afraid to talk in meetings. I'm afraid. I'm like, why? I'm afraid I'll say the wrong thing or I'll say a word that was maybe fine yesterday, but it's not fine now. And I'm really afraid. And I was like, well, Karen, I, her name is Karen. Which is <laughs> her actual name is Karen with a Y. Um, I said, I can't have it that you're, afraid to talk in meetings, like I need you to lead the meetings, I need you to encourage everyone to speak, and this is, this is the damage, is everyone's afraid to talk. How can you have a culture that is collaborative and innovative? You know, we used to start every brainstorming with there's no bad ideas. Now apparently every idea is bad, and you better, you know, use, not use the wrong word. So, yeah, I was, I guess I was surprised at the intensity of it. Um, but I think, look, the left is, I spent my life as a lefty. I wouldn't call myself a lefty or necessarily a progressive anymore. I don't know what I am anymore. Um, but I, they're the ones who say it doesn't exist, but I, they're the ones who are inflicting, I think, cancel culture. I think it's often women, honestly. I think women do more than canceling. Yeah. I don't know why. Women are, they're policing our actions. My, my, I, yeah, I mean, men, I guess, will just punch you. <laughs> Women try to get you canceled. Uh, uh, that's, that is my experience, and certainly I have a lot of canceled friends, and that has been their experience as well. Um, but yes, I was, I was very surprised, and of course, now I see it everywhere. Um, and I, look, the left is, I, I believe, um, the pro censorship party. I mean, you do see some of it on, on both sides, but I, I definitely feel it and see it more on the left. Mm -hmm. um, they're the uh, safety obsessed side, which is how we get to the speech is violence, which I think is so dangerous. Um, and so I just can't, yeah, I can't be part of that anymore. I heard, um, I was listening to a podcast just the other day, Greg Lukiano. Uh, who wrote the book they, um, uh, canceling? Yeah, that, it, it's got a book canceling on the American mind. The podcast with um, Gordon Peterson, which I recommend. He said um, twice as many professors have been fired in the last few years as during the entire McCarthy era. Um, yeah, about that. cancellation. Definitely um, get the book. I'm very. I mean, I'm featured, and the corporate executive. Teacher no. who's been canceled. I'm the, the most notable corporate. The, the book just came out. One last question for me, and then I'll turn over to the audience. Uh, um, uh, you, uh, um, on page uh, 159, you say, um, you talk about the things Levi's have done in the past, and you talk about how proud you were the Levi's things. And then you said, yet as I write this, I'm still puzzling over where I think the line should be drawn. When is it appropriate for corporations to move beyond protecting employees to take overtly political stands? beyond the walls of the company. I'm sure you've been thinking about that more since then, and I'm wondering if you have any firmer uh, uh, views on when if ever that's appropriate. You know, Levi's didn't really make the pivot until um, like the mid 2010s, late teens, you know, 2018, 2019. And even in 18, I, you know, I described the vote campaign. It really was just saying go vote, which is argue, arguably is not partisan. I mean, it is. Um, it wasn't until after that that it really started to kind of accelerate with very specific, um, clearly partisan stances. Um, I actually think we should go back to implement policies that protect employees and offer equality for all employees. If that makes some employees mad, look, when Levi's integrated factories and they said, this white person has to sit next to this black person at a sewing machine in a factory, some people quit. To them I say, good riddance. 
They were not taking rights away from any employees. They were offering the same rights to all employees. Same with same-sex partner benefits. If you were offended by that as an employee because you are, in fact, anti-LGBTQ, then I guess you can go work at some other jeans company. They didn't take anyone else's rights away. They took no one's benefits away. In fact, when they offered same-sex partner benefits, because you could not be married at the time and, and, and be gay, they also offered not same-sex partner benefits to people that weren't married. I don't know how you would say that. Like, if you would live with someone, um, you were in a relationship um, that was a heterosexual relationship, they also offered benefits. So to me, that was great, right? You're giving more benefits to everybody. I think that's the one. I do. And I, I think that can be applied to how you run your business, too. So I'll give you an example. China. You, because you know, Levi's doesn't own and operate any of their factories anymore. Most apparel companies do not. It's, it's a rarity. And so, you know, you're making products in other uh, facilities that you do not own. Um, if Uyghur forced labor is being used in those factories, I would not, and Levi's doesn't. And let me be clear, they do not manufacture any product in China. So that's great. <laughs> um, Nike does, Apple does. <laughs> uh, and in fact, they've taken many votes at the board level on this very issue and have always said, yes, we will continue to manufacture in China. Um, so again, if it's how you run your business, that I think is fair. When it comes to campaigns touting issues that are clearly political, I think that is not how I would run a large business. Now, if I ran a small business that was catering to a consumer base that felt ignored by the large brands, I might in fact do that. And I think you could grow to a decently sized business in doing it. Privately held businesses are presumably different from public corporations. Yeah, I mean, I think what, what you should do is do what you do honestly. Stop, like don't, just stop with the, what, the bullshit, right? Like if you are going, there are companies like, um, you know, I guess Ben and Jerry's could be argued to have taken stances that I don't necessarily agree with, but they followed the path to it actually impacting their business. Like, I guess if you're going to stand by it, fine. <laughs> It's the lie and the hypocrisy that I cannot abide. And I think for larger businesses, like I said, Bud Light, again, being the case study here that will be studied in business schools, I think, for a very long time to come because they persist in being 25% down um, month after month. Um, they decided they didn't like the consumer they had and they wanted to try to get a new one. <laughs> and the thing is, there was a way to actually go about expanding your consumer base and making it younger. I'm sure they had an aging um, consumer like Levi's had had. And there was a way to actually court a new, younger, hipper, cooler consumer without pissing everybody off. And I think being, frankly, my perspective is a little disrespectful to women, but that's, there were, there are ways to do this. It's the like cardinal, that's the thing in business is you, when you try to engage a new user, you do it in a way that makes your current user still feel good about the brand and the business and purchase it. There's a way to do both. You can do both. Um, so I think they've learned that lesson. The, the cardinal. Let's open up the, the floor. Questions over here. Yeah. I think that uh, with this being in, in an educational format and setting, do you agree? I listened to Paul Fitzgerald of 1792 Exchange. I don't know if you're aware of him, but he says that there's a now a stakeholder mentality yes. where executives, business people are being taught that there is more than just the investor. Yeah. And the other part of that question is also teaching in schools. In my opinion, very few people understand that the customer can set the price, the investor sets the return, and the company has to live on the middle. So yeah. I think if the education got back to investor, simple for business, yeah. and the uh, teaching that, hey, if I wanted to give everybody a $50 million 
raise, I could pay $2 million per t-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> I Yes, there has been a shift to what's called stakeholder capitalism versus, you know, shareholder. Um, I, here's what I don't think. But I, I'm not really a conspiracy theorist, although I find myself in the midst of cohort of raging <laughs> conspiracy theorists as a COVID dissenter. I don't think there's like people in a room at BlackRock, you know, <laughs> deciding that we're going to do this reset and we don't care if we don't make money and it's all about ESG. And they're not talking about ESG right now. I don't know if you've noticed, they've all sort of removed it. Um, in the, in the last few months from their sort of key talking points. I think they all got swept up. They all got swept up in this ego stuff that I talked about, in being liked and being revered and everyone they know agreeing with them. All these businesses are in California and New York. They don't know people in Colorado and they don't know people in Texas. And I, you know, I would tell you at, at Levi's, we had a, we had one office in Texas, in Westlake, Texas, a very small office. And oftentimes when we took these stances, we'd get some angry folks, you know, writing out of Westlake. And it was like the, the way they were ignored and dismissed as like not even real people. Because the real people live in California, Los Angeles, and New York, and all my friends agree. And so, and, and at the end of the day, they believed it was going to make them more money. That's what I, it, it, there is no altruism. There is no effective altruism. There is only, if I align this brand with what I perceive the values of the good people to be, then I will make more money. When they do not make more money at it, they will stop doing it. BlackRock included, <laughs> Goldman included. They don't, that's, they just will. There, there was a, have you guys heard of this um, Charlie Javits? Do you know who this is? Did I get the name wrong? I wrote it down. I wanted to tell the story. It's very short. Okay, J.P. Morgan, okay. Her company was called Frank, this college student, Charlie Javits. You can go look it up. Um, the whole thing was supposed to help college students, underprivileged college kids from low-income families, like navigate the loan process and the grant process because it's Byzantine and it's difficult. And she was going to help kids get to college, right? She sold the company for now $175 million to J.P. Morgan Chase. Okay. There were supposedly three or four million people in the database. Guess what happened the first round of emails with J.P. Morgan's Chase sent out? Zero of the emails were real. They were all fake. They all landed in empty, non-existent email boxes and got a zero response rate. She made the whole thing up. Do you think they're, they didn't do the due diligence that they would normally do? You'd think you would check to see if the emails were real. They didn't do it because they were caught up in her story of her world changing story. Do you think they're going to do that again? JP Morgan Chase? Uh, I don't think they will. Got, um, uh, in the purple sweater and then front and then back. In the front oh, the the yeah. Fabulous. Um, <laughs> I experienced projecting groups like this because I teach 20 year olds, and I can tell you, I have, probably, I have one. Yeah, yeah, they're insane. Yeah, <laughs> my kids, like my kids, I love you. a cute push. This is actually getting me somewhere, which I, is if you're running a brand that's trying to appeal to young people. to mercurial lunatics, how is that going to affect? <laughs> Trying to keep up a coherent brand identity. I mean, just we're talking about being scared of young employees. What makes you think they're learning to scared of your customers, right? Mm -hmm. And if you're worried your customers want altruism, they want Ben and Jerry's, they want yeah. a strong political identity. How do you handle that as a marketer? And especially jumping But they back also to shop like, at Brandy Melville. I know they're I know they're unpredictable, right? Do you guys know what that store is? I mean, it's like teen store and all the shorts are like this big and like there's nothing altruistic about it it's just sort of overly sexy clothes for 12 year olds <laughs> yeah. they've convinced themselves that there's more upside from associating with the perceived values of these young people right 
they forget. And like I said, that for a big, large brand, Levi's is a brand that is older because they, they, people who are 80 wear Levi's and people who are 10 wear Levi's. So that makes the average age older than for most fashion brands. And so you have to court that broad base. It's also more conservative um, than the typical fashion brands. Like we actually knew the political leanings. Up. It's also a brand that operates in 120 countries and not everybody around the world agrees. The only way forward is to focus on the product. They aren't going to notice. Did you stop and ask yourself, or did these kids in your class stop and ask themselves, why didn't Popeyes make a statement about <laughs> um, the war in Israel? <laughs> like, no, it's like they, they've convinced, <laughs> they, they, they've convinced sure. themselves. I, there's this like flurry of activity internally every time some event in the world happens. And there's a flurry of employees saying, you have to make a statement. You have to make a statement. Do you remember the shootings in Atlanta at the um, spa where yeah. I think it was seven out of eight Asian of uh, the people murdered were Asian. The Asian employees, there are a lot in San Francisco. San Francisco is 40% Asian. A lot of people screaming, you have to make a statement. I, what, that murder is bad? I mean, yeah, what do you, what is the statement? It's like crazy. Um, and so there's this flurry of activity inside the company and everybody, all the executives come together and they, they try to write a statement and they never stop and say, we just don't have to. We're gonna talk about the jeans. And maybe if there's a couple really angry employees, you sit down with them and you explain why you're not going to, but you don't have to. And so I guess my answer is no one's gonna notice if you don't do it. I don't think they will. They still eat Chick-fil-A, <laughs> even though it's a company that supposedly is not aligned with what they say their values are. It's a very Christian. Do you think that, that Levi's actually, Levi's customer base skews conservative more than? I mean, it's like 51%, yeah, but like more than most fashion brands. It is a fascinating product. though. Is there anybody in this room who doesn't own a pair of Levi's? Mm -hmm. Really? <laughs> Usually in any given room, it's about 85, 90%. So yeah, so it's about 90%. Are you wearing Levi's? I am. Um, damn. So a few, a few decades ago, Michael Jordan said something yeah. about Air Jordan that's so famous that I, I know you already know what I'm, I'm going to say. Republicans yeah, right. buy sneakers too. Yeah. Republicans we buy sneakers that. too, right. So when you got a company like Levi's, which sells, which you know, from your your surveys, or you would, it would be it would be a malpractice on your part if you didn't know that. I don't yeah. think you would predict yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. That Republicans <laughs> buy Air Jordans, or Republicans right. buy Levi's. Yeah. How can is it? How can people have forgotten <laughs> that Republicans buy sneakers too? <laughs> is it is it really that they matter that they? Think, um, they think they're the bad. They, they don't yeah. believe it. There's a cognitive dissonance. Everybody they know agrees with that. Literally every person. So I'm sure that, I, see, I, I, I never had a real job in my life since graduate school. I've only been in academia. Um, so I'm very familiar with the yeah. culture out of which probably most of these companies hire. Um, yeah. So I can see being in an epistemic bubble, and it's it's their yeah. job. If you're a marketer, surely it's your job to know your your client base. And then there were, there's what was so amazing, so incredible to so many of us outside looking in about the Bud Light thing. It wasn't even so much the camp or tiny campaign as what the woman I don't know what she was, but some yeah. kind of marketer. Oh, said, no, only, I agree. That was the cardinal sin in yeah. my mind. A, Which was shit. basically, we hate, we yeah. hate. I agree. I, I agree. I think that was the worst part of the whole thing. She mm -hmm. said, we had horrible fratty customers and we yeah. want new ones. Basically, I mean, that's yeah. basically what she said yeah. two days before it launched. I mean, I wouldn't, I don't drink Bud Light. I like beer, but that's crappy beer. That, yeah. let, me, <laughs> let me just say one thing about the beer thing too. Uh, to my earlier point about make great product, if they offered a product that was differentiated and actually good, this would have been impossible. 
because nobody wants to give it up. It's why nobody gives up the Nikes and they will twist themselves in knots to continue buying them despite what horrors come out of that place, whether it's, you know, in, in the Uyghurs in China or whether it's um, what they, how they treat women internally, people will twist themselves in knots to keep buying it because the product is good and differentiated and it has a ton of cachet. Um, yeah, I mean, the bowline thing was surprising to me because most of these boycotts don't last very long on either side. The right and the left do them and they don't work. I mean, you know, the lefties went crazy in, I think it was like 2017 because the head of New Balance said something vaguely praising Trump. They were, the lefties were burning their sneakers in the trash cans, just like the other people when Kaepernick whatever, all of it, when they did, you know. Um, and that same year, New Balance sales grew 7.5%. 7.5%. And I will tell you, the people that buy New Balance are hipsters in Brooklyn and Silver Lake. That is who drives that business. And so they they did, it didn't last. That's what's so surprising about this Bud Light thing. And I haven't quite put a finger on why it's a boycott that stuck. But I think part of it is the product is garbage. And so if you can find something that's exactly the same, Coors Light, Miller's Light, whatever, then so again, it goes back to my point, focus on making great differentiated product. In the back. Hi, so very interesting talk, very compelling story. I enjoyed it quite a bit. I generally buy your line that there's this kind of obvious profit motive. I wonder whether there's a sort of deeper psychological element, which I is that so. In an economy, and I think this helps explain why consumers will do what you just described, but they yeah. go on to the next thing. That at bottom, there's a kind of discomfort we have with the materialistic kind of pleasure seeking society, and we constantly seek some way to ennoble it. Mm -hmm. and, and at a certain point, if that gets too dominant, it can actually yeah. undermine the very phenomenon. And for yeah. me, and I want to get your opinion on this because I just don't know enough about this world, but for me, the great counterexample of this is the way. Uh, Twitter was run before Elon Musk and probably also under Elon Musk, but in a different way where it seems like profit ceased to really matter in the way it ought to. Now, is that just because social media competition doesn't work in the same way as it does with jeans or, or you know, other sort of goods where it's sort of less of a barrier to entry? You can't really build a new Twitter from scratch. We saw it Instagram and Facebook tried that, but that's not going so high. Uh, what, what explains that kind of phenomenon where it seems like you don't get that same pushback until somebody offers to buy it at way too high rate. I think okay, so there's sort of a bunch of questions there. The first one, yes, and I write about this in the book. It is a form of it's keyboard activism, right? Like I don't have to actually do anything. I can wear this T-shirt. <laughs> I can wear a Levi's T-shirt with a rainbow bat wing, and I'm showing that I am an activist and on the right side of this. Right? He's laughing, but you know I'm right. <laughs> um, I've been with you. So it, <laughs> it, redeems, it redeems the fact that not Levi's, but that the sneakers made in China because it has a rainbow. So I don't well, it also that. redeems the fact that you're a capitalist and you know like nice things, and you're not supposed to because you pretend you're a democratic socialist, and um, you know, yeah. I mean, I see my children wrestling with this you know every they don't want to want stuff <laughs> they want it you know so i think it's it's um capitalism as activism but it's uh, bullshit so i yes i i think um that is that is part of it the second part of the question social media i don't think they've been trying to drive that business into the ground. <laughs> I don't think Jack Dorsey tried. I don't think Elon is trying. I think Elon desperately wants this to work. Yeah. Uh, he wants it to both be a platform um, that allows for free speech and he wants to make money. I think that, again, Dorsey thought, well, I don't want to say what Jack Dorsey thought, but he, they, they thought the way to make more money was to do what they were doing. 
Twitter has not figured out how to monetize, you know, what they have. That's been a problem for 10 years. I think in the last 12 years, they've <clears throat> only been profitable two years. So whether it was under Dorsey or whether it's under Elon, they have not figured out a way to do it yet in the way that other social media platforms have. You just don't have advertisers in the same way. For We didn't advertise on Twitter, but we spent a ton of money on Instagram. Um, so I think there's several issues there. Um, and I, I think you have this just uniform corporate culture. It was in San Francisco. They all thought the same thing. They all thought they were on the right side. Oh, and by the way, you had pretty serious governmental pressure. <laughs> I'm talking about before Elon. So all those things are tough. And yeah, it's not easy to build a new social media platform and get people to move. They do though, you have them. I mean, look, TikTok seems to be doing fine. Snapchat came and went. I don't know. It's hard. For most of the time, but we've got two more questions in here, here and then the trend. So you mentioned a bunch of things on up to along the way about media, right? And we just kind of came off that, but not media as media rather than as a company. And you were at Levi for pre pre social, pre internet. Yeah. That's a long stretch, it's right? Easier so than back when yeah, a lot of these are CMO, you know, marketing is different than oh, yeah. kind of that. How much? as not only social media, but also the media, right? And yeah. this divisiveness of the media really driven from your perspective, drove the activity that they took against you, right? Their stance against you uh, from the corporate standpoint, but also driving that need of CEOs to, to you know, make a statement, make a statement. How much of that is to see it go viral and to see it influence? Oh, for sure. Right? Versus, the, yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. Social media. I mean, gosh, my job was so much easier when I started. Yeah. You like made two TV commercials, you hit play, and you sort of sat there and hoped <laughs> for the best and then read the results. Like that versus pushing content out every day that you have to make and create and you have to interact with your fans and you can't say the wrong thing. And yeah, everybody's chasing the clout and the CEOs like it. They want to know how many likes they got for the post on whatever. <laughs> Um, so yeah, that absolutely has to do with it. I, I mean, I think there's, I, I didn't mention it earlier, but you know, beyond corporate America, obviously the polarization, at least to, to my mind, became so much worse in 2016 when Trump got elected. And that caused a lot of media to lose their minds. Um, and it just didn't, I mean, I lost my mind for a hot second. And then I was like, this is stupid. Um, <laughs> whatever let's keep going um so that was a dividing line yes social media but that polarization that happened and that us versus them and you are with us or against us or you are you used to be able to be um there was such a thing for instance as a pro-choice republican and there was a pro-life democrat like you could not veer from the party on certain things and not be banished into hell and now you cannot at least not on the left i'm not so sure about on the right well, I feel like someone should answer your question that you know that you asked would be yeah, and I I I, I do not think corporations should be involved in that. So <laughs> deserve an answer. Yeah. We're almost out of time, but please. Trent, do you want to? Oh yeah, last question. I was going to say uh, universities and businesses and their boards are also encouraged to take stands on issues, and these distractions can degrade the product universities offer. So, do you believe universities should avoid taking political positions? I think universities, I'm not obviously an academic, so, but I believe, I think universities need to create the space for kids and students to speak up and say whatever they want, for professors to enjoy academic freedom. I don't think universities themselves as entities should take positions. Obviously, this is in the news a lot right now with the conflict in the Middle East. And I think, I mean, I've, I, I, I've said this. I think the silence is somewhat, I'll talk about the corporate world for a second. You know, the corporate world all of a sudden now can't weigh in on this. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think they should. What do they know about the conflict in the Middle East? They know nothing. But they can't, they all said whatever they said about Ukraine and they all weighed in on every single subject that popped up in the last five years. And I think it's interesting that now is the time that they don't weigh in on international problems. Mm -hmm. 
The Calvin, if you're interested in this, the Calvin Report, K A L V E N, from that Chicago is, yes. many decades ago. It's a very powerful statement. So I'll let that be for us. I disagree with the uh, situation where corporate shouldn't weigh on some publications. Because, in fact, what if the public stance is wrong <laughs> and they, in fact, have information to suggest that it's wrong, but the public doesn't want to hear? That's a fair point. Can you give me an example? Sure. I mean, you can talk about uh, some of the bad numbers on climate change. Mm. Not, a, not an issue about climate change, but there's a lot of really bad numbers out there, mm. which are causing some very you know, unfortunate decisions. And you've got some very respected individuals like Conan and other side. Another one is on they should weigh in on affordable housing. Yeah. There's issues that come up Fair in the public domain on affordable housing that has a terrific mm -hmm. effect on their ability to uh, recruit and retain. So I, I think there, there's I some think issues. Right. I think consistency is key though. And if you're gonna weigh in, you have to accept that it might be tough. And yeah, I, I think business leaders should have come together to say, we're keeping our stores and restaurants open. Well, there's, no, there's no question about that. I understand you're saying that. Mm -hmm. But there are issues, that, and you agree, that if they've got better facts than what's being fed to the public, yes. they should step forward. Yes, I guess what's in the news all the time are businesses stepping forward on issues that they have no better facts. They're just saying, I don't know what they're saying. And we support. The, we just have, the, opinion. We just have an opinion that's the right opinion, which hopefully will make you buy our T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, thank but you, Jennifer. Uh,